Thanks, Anu. The stage is yours. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed that that little introduction. Um, sometimes it's difficult to recognise myself, um, but the reality is that I wear several hats. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me and what those are. So first of all, my best claim to fame is being God's child. And I really do take that seriously. But also I lead worship that I'm doing, um, which is a, it's a, it's a secular choir, but involving Christian music. I'm a, I'm a vocal coach. I'm a singer songwriter. Um, I, I play a piano and I am a criminal barrister by profession. So, um, we're going to examine the title Countercultural, Countercultural Living. And first of all, I'd like to dive straight in with what might this actually mean? So, first of all, I'll start with the, the perspective of the, the world, the dictionary meaning of it. So, counterculture, uh, a noun, a way of life and a set of attitudes opposed to or at variance with the prevailing social norm. So that's our, our standard dictionary definition of what counterculture itself means. But I'd like to really focus on a biblical perspective, if you, if you may. And um, here we have it. John 17, when Jesus prays for the church, for me, I think this is a really powerful um, way of putting it that, that Jesus did and, and, and showing us what we do in our relationship to the mainstream and the rest of the world. And I'm sure we know it very well. I have given them your word um, and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And so I think that this is a really good place to, to focus on and to really anchor ourselves in when we're talking about our position within the, the rest of the world and what we are expected to do and how we, we, we live our lives. So I suppose my first question to you, and this is a rhetorical one because at the moment I can't actually see your questions, but my first question to you would be, is it necessary to be countercultural in the dictionary sense of the word. So in relation to that first slide that I put up, which I'll just um, put up again and just remind you of, is it necessary to be countercultural, to live in a way that's countercultural in this sense of the word? And I'd like you to really consider that and think about that and think about what you think your answer to that might be. Um, and the reason why I'd like you to think about that is because I would like to suggest that our answers can be different to each other. My view is that everybody would have to answer that question for themselves. So our answers might be identical each to each other, but they actually may not be. Um, and even breaking that down further, one person's answer for a specific issue might actually be different for their answer for another issue. And, and we're going back, let's focus in on that dictionary definition in, in the sense of doing something that is different to what the rest of the world does. And why do I, why do I say this? Why do I say our answers might be different to each other? Um, and I'll, I'll take you back to the, 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 the scripture from St. John and, um, and reference why. Because in, in the scripture, in my view, everything begins from the word. Jesus said, I have given them your word. And I read that conjunctively. So it, 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 uh, that's to say, I read that in terms of what he says about being given the word is then related to what comes next. The world has hated them because 
of the word because when we internalize God's word, when we take it on, it makes sure that we are not of the world necessarily. Okay, so in my view and the way I'm gonna continue this um, address to you and this conversation with you is that everything begins and ends with the word of God and our relationship to it. And so when you look at things from that perspective, it may or may not take you away from what the mainstream thought of the world is. Jesus says that often it will do and will be hated by the world. But I think in practical terms, in this day and age, um, um, the application of that might look differently depending on where we are. Okay, so I wanna give some examples of what might be considered to be countercultural living from my life. But before I do that, I wanna just make sure that, the, that you've got the point that I'm zeroing in on, which is that we are, what we're doing is in line with God's word. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we prepared to follow through with God's word, even if that means that we're going in the total opposite direction of what everyone else is doing? I would suggest to you that the focus should be on that question. Are we prepared to go where God's word takes us? And in fact, in, for me, the reaction of the world is actually irrelevant in many regards. Whether I'm aligned with it or not is irrelevant because I'm trying to keep my eyes on God's word, although I can't pretend that I always succeed. Anyway, so moving on, in terms of um, discussing some examples and trying to make it as practical as I can for you. The best thing I can really do is just to, to tell you about my life. I mean, that's the, the best way that I can, I can come across and uh, demonstrate what I'm talking about to you. So here is a little picture of what my life <laughs> used to look like. <laughs> so I was called to the criminal bar in 2001 uh, a little while ago and uh, that's me as a baby barrister just uh, there and running all types of criminal cases and um, starting off very young and really I went into the profession because of my own culture I mean quite literally the West African culture encouraged going into the profession um, one of a few professions and this was one of them that was deemed acceptable and uh, um, so that's why I went into it and grew and thrived and I was a criminal barrister for 14 years but there came a point where it became clear to me that something had to give I always had a love for music um, I always wanted to do music in my heart of hearts but I went with the culture in terms of what was expected of me and so on and so forth. And whilst I've described it as a West African culture, to be fair, it's a, a general thing. If you think about what we look at in terms of um, what's acceptable and respected in society, high earning, you know, a decent status um, that comes with the occupation, the power that comes with the occupation, all of those things in mainstream culture are seen as desirable. And I spent a lot of time in the profession, if I'm, if I'm honest, as part of that, as part of that reason. Not to say that, it, of course, in itself, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't good and it wasn't um, important. It was, it was important work and I took it as a calling and I did my best to assist and minister to the people that I, I could do. And I really took it seriously in that way and I think some good work was done, but, the initial entry into it and the maintenance of it over that time had a lot to do with what society thought I should be doing and what I thought I should be doing um, in accordance with that. So when in 2015, I decided that the passion of my heart was really not with being a criminal barrister and was actually with music, and everything that came around it, music ministry, because all that time I'd been running choirs and, and, and ministering in church and so on and so forth. So when I decided to do that, most people thought I was crazy. They thought I was absolutely balmy. 
Um, <laughs> and I, I suppose I can I pose this question to you. Um, I just, just bear with me a moment as I get it up. I pose this question to you. What would, would you leave a six figure job? <laughs> Even as I think about it now, I still laugh. Would you leave a high earning or a six figure paid salary for, or not salary, I was, I was an independent practice, but for absolutely nothing? And what would make you do that? Why would you do that? And the very simple answer for me was I heard the word of the Lord really clearly. And it was in a number of very audible ways that I couldn't I I ignore. The first time was at a, a function that I went to in, in a church. It was a ministry night of some sort. I can't even remember precisely what it was. But a lady who I hardly knew came up to me and she said, I have a word from the Lord for you. Um, and she said to me, a number of things which I won't share with you that really resonated because I believe that you must test every word as the scripture says and you and and the Holy Spirit is within us and so that will resonate if the word that's speaking to you is clearly coming from him again and so what I was hearing was resonating with me and then she went on to this this verse and it was James 4 13 and it was come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. And the specific word that came to me was, you've all, up until this time, bear in mind this lady didn't know me. The word was, up until this time, you have directed your life. But from this time on, commit every single part of your professional life. And she was very clear about that. Professional life to the Lord. And let him direct you. Let him take the reins. Let him do with you what he will wills and you just follow. And that really shook me. And it had such a profound impact on me, but it still took me another couple of years before I acted on it in the drastic way that I'm, I'm talking to you about. So what happened? Well, the work in terms of the music work that I used to do all the time, that continued on. I was working with the choir that I, I was working with significantly at the time called the, the Reapers Choir. And we were doing lots of things. We were invited to so many places, 10 Downing Street, um, Kensington Palace, the Royal Albert Hall, and so on and so forth, just t to minister and from church to church. So sometimes we'd be singing to three people and sometimes we'd be singing to thousands of people. And so that was going on and on and on. Um, and I was so busy, but I was still conducting very big, serious criminal cases. I hardly used to go into chambers. So I went into chambers for the first time after about four or five months. And I spoke to my, my senior clerk who had clerked me. A clerk is like a booking agent. So they get the work in and then they get a percentage of everything you get from the work. So I spoke to my, my clerk and he'd clerked me for many, many years. And I said, can I table a meeting with you, please, just to discuss the future? Now, at that time, I knew that at some time, point in the future, I wanted to stop doing crime and I wanted to move into to music ministry of some kind. And, and immediately in the room that day, I just wanted to table a meeting. But he said to me, OK, Anu, yes, we know. We've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for you. We're a very spiritual clerk's room. Well, that was news to me because I didn't know they were a spiritual clerk's room. And I said, we've been watching you. We know that you are a light sent into the world. I was like, what? They said, uh, my clerk said to me, I've clerked you for like 10, 12 years. And I had big plans for you. I wanted to make you a Queen's Council. I don't know if that was really in his power. <laughs> but, you know, he said, but I, I wanted to fight for you. He said, but I cannot fight God. I was like, what? My jaw was hanging because all I knew about him in terms of any spirituality was that his parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. I had no idea that there was any kind of insight of this kind. At first, I thought that I had done something wrong and they were trying to kick me out and, and that, you know, a solicitor had complained about my work or something. But actually, after a long conversation, it became abundantly clear that God was using him to tell me, the time is now for you to go. So he said, we're not taking any new cases for you from today. 
I was horrified because obviously the rugs pulled out of my feet from under my feet. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got no safety there now. Is this really happening? And as I was there, you know, flabbergasted, he said to me, yeah, in this half an hour, have you ever complained and said you don't want to leave? And that was it for me. I thought, Lord, I'm hearing your voice. And that was the last time I took a case. It took about six to nine months for me to, to complete my cases, but that was it in 2015. Now, if if I knew what I then, what I know now, I might not have jumped in such a way. But that was definitely the voice of God speaking to me and God has kept me, you know. Um, it hasn't been an easy road by any stretch of any imagination, so I'm not gonna pretend that. But as we speak, I'm about to start a new job as music director in an organization in Liverpool. So uh, the journey has been incredible and I I've done my best. I can't say I've always done it, but I've done my best to follow God's word. And so I I'd like to, to issue that as a challenge um, to you. I know that a theme of, of this entire um, conference has been Joshua 179, be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Don't turn from the left to the right that you might be successful. Now, I'm not going to pretend that, that I've done that, but I did try. And I, I didn't even know that I was being courageous. They, the, 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 the rest of the barristers kept me on the door of chambers for, for a good few years because they didn't think that I would stay out. They thought I was coming back. But by the grace of God, uh, that was it. So can I encourage you to be strong and courageous? All right. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is um, in terms of countercultural living is on a slightly different topic, a, a very different topic, in fact. So I'm I'm shifting gears. Um, and can I indicate immediately to you, please, that there is a trigger warning in terms of the things that I would like to discuss. So issues of a sensitive nature regarding sexual abuse will now will be discussed now. So please, if it's something that you find very difficult, please switch off, go and have a cup of tea or something like that. And um, because we, I really want you to, to be safe and healthy and, and, um, and not troubled in any way. But during the pandemic, and uh, nobody needs to be reminded of the effect of that, I had to come to terms with a, a lot of my childhood and how traumatic a lot of it was. Half of it was amazing. I had wonderful God-bearing parents, parents, a wonderful family, a wonderful church community. And I really mean that. And, and by and by, I was a very happy child and a confident child, but I was hiding a very dark secret. And that was that I was being abused by a close family member of the church who in fact called himself a Christian too. Um, a, a close family member, sorry, I said of the church, I didn't mean that. I meant a close family member who was who called himself a Christian too. And um, it was a very difficult time um, during the pandemic because I had to come to grips, you know, over 40 years later, well, approaching 40 years later of what that meant for me. You know, we all had time to think and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, that... Putting that in the context of growing up with all these things, and that's me singing. Um, well, I'm not really singing. I'm just standing by a microphone, but that's in the church. Um, a supportive community, singing in the church choir, singing solos and leading songs. I did start that from the age of seven, so from a very young age. Um, but, you know, why was this able to happen? And so during the process of grappling with this during the pandemic i sought therapy which i really recommend it was very helpful for me and there came a point where i thought there must be an opportunity for me to use everything that i have done in my life the 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 law the music the teaching i was working with with up to a thousand children a week once i moved from law into music um, in schools, in primary schools and secondary schools. So all of that, I thought to myself, there must be a way to combine all of this and join the chorus of people who are really speaking out um, and, and, and just being able to intercept and speak to children through a really fun, musical way 
to give them the tools to protect themselves. Because I just thought if such evil could be per pervasive, when I had the best of everything in terms of God, church, family, extended family and community, and still I was, I was a victim, there must be a way of penetrating um, the church environment and schools and every kind of environment with, with a resource that would really assist. Um, but before I go on, I wanna ask you this, what would you say if I told you that even speaking up about child abuse or, or racism, in my view and in my experience over the last couple of years, is countercultural to the norm in the Christian community and the general community. And I'm saying that countercultural in the dictionary sense of the word, not in the John 17 4 bit. And I, I just pose that question to you and I, I'd ask you to, to consider whether you agree with that or disagree with that. And you know, you think to yourself, do you hear this discussed a lot, what I'm about to discuss or what I'm discussing with you? Is this something that's really taken up? I mean, safeguarding issues now are, thank God, in church. But in terms of taking preventative measures, in terms of being proactive, in terms of really reaching out and saying, what can we do about this? About sexual abuse, about racism, because I then moved on to discuss racism because actually I've, I've suffered that too. And what was so interesting to me was that the trauma that I felt was so similar, if not identical, to the trauma that I felt being abused. There's no, because pain is pain, there's no difference, you know? So I want you to think about this because my, my experience has been that actually, <laughs> it's against the mainstream, not in terms of being of op in opposition to it, but in terms of, of, in the sense of, it's not what is normally done. And people are very shy about it, and people would prefer to be silent about it, and they would prefer to, to, to brush it under the carpet. But I couldn't be silent. It was impossible for me to be silent. By the time I, I, I was making my way through the pandemic, I was in therapy, you know, lots of memories that had been repressed were coming to the fore. I was seeing things from a different perspective. It was like there was a fire burning in me. And, and remember that I said at the beginning of this address to you that everything is based on God's word. But sometimes we hear God's word in different ways. And I felt that it was like a still small voice. I just could not be silent. And then by the time George Floyd was murdered and um, all the outcry about racism and so on and so forth occurred, I found it impossible. And that stirring and that burning in my heart in my view was God's word to me saying, you just have to do something about this. And so here I go off again <laughs> and I try and, and I take an action, sometimes jumping in without, without thinking about it, but just saying, Lord, all right, if this is what you're saying to me, all right, this is, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. So um, I decided to, to do what I, 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 I just spoke to you about and to make some resources um, to deal with the issue. And I'd like to share with you the very first one that I made. It's called Precious and Private. I'm just gonna play a very little clip for you. Hopefully all the technical things work. Please, can somebody tell me if it doesn't work, if you can't hear the sound or if there's any issue. Um, and, and the point was to put it in very, very innocuous, harmless, child-friendly, fun, language and animation so that it's it, it's a tool to communicate with children whether in schools classes sunday schools um at, in at the home for, in terms of precious and private um and yet the children don't even know the gravity of what you're discussing they just think it's another fun thing that they're watching but they're internalizing the messages and that was the idea behind it so that I, I set up an organization and an initiative called difficult discussions easy songs and that's the whole idea behind it so i'll just play this one for you now it's only a few sec um, a few uh, about a minute or so then I move and tip my shoulders, my arms and my hands To my belly, then my legs and my knees It's so precious to me Oh precious to me There are places that I've missed out My 
my chest and my bottom back and front Anywhere that my underwear covers up for me is pregnant Okay, so that's the, that was the first one that led me into it. And then I was commissioned by um, a Church of England church who had a look at that and said, hang on, we want to do this about racism, but we want it with biblical content. And so I was like, that would be amazing. And so I'm about to show you what we did with that. And the, the, that um, resource is called We Are One, and it's comprised of two songs. The first song is called In His Image and it's based on Genesis 2, 26. And the second song is called You and Me and it's based on Micah 6, 8. So the easiest thing for me is just to show you the, the little advert. Please forgive me, it's not a sell. I'm just showing you something that I've done that is actually countercultural. So um, here we go. I'm a child of God, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a child of God, yeah, yeah, yeah. So who am I to see your skin as anything but perfected in the eyes of God? like to show you if I may some of the effects of children um, taking this on board and, and singing it and running with it so uh, here we go forgive me I'm the child and teaching future generations to live according to God's word and counter to culture here we go just a couple more and, and I think the thing for me is that this is no longer just um, me trying to live in a way that follows God's word but the, the greatest joy and I, I really can tell you there's just nothing that compares to it is seeing children proclaiming God's word and their identity in it and taking that on board in terms of how they should treat each other but with a focus on 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 the reasons why which is based on god's word there's just nothing like it here here's a church um using the resource So that's the end of the song where they where they're saying so if 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 we really love each other love love each other as god says we should do let's walk like it talk like it think like it act like it and here was a, a school that i took to blackheath concert hall um late last year they were so sweet this was the rehearsal
think I'll stop that there. And the words they were saying were, as God's creation, we should be his mirror for the world to see. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. As, as God's creation, we should be his mirror for the world to see. I'm reflecting God. Yeah, you're reflecting God. Yeah. And so I come to the end of my address to you. And just to wrap it up, um, I would say that following God's word is the key to all of this. Whether that makes you countercultural or not, in my view, is really not the point. I do think, however, that following God's word is likely to make you countercultural. <laughs> it's likely, more than likely, to bring you away from the, the, the mainstream view. But not necessarily, because I mean, in some ways, you know, the world is talking about uh, the impact of race um, and identity, but we we know that the way that we see identity is different from the, world, the way the world sees identity. So even in that, there are nuances and divergence. Um, but for me, the real point is focus on God's word and not everybody else's reaction. The little bonus point that I would slide in here before I finish, as I finish, is that the daily decisions are the hardest. So I've, I've taken, you know, big things, changing jobs, creating this resource as, as um, illustrations for you. To, that hopefully you can take something from. But in practice, actually, I have found that the, the decision to love, even though I'm upset, the decision to forgive, even though I'm, 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 I'm exceptionally hurt um, and, and without apology, the, the decision to, to choose the scripture over what, what everybody else says, to choose God's word, over what my present circumstances say, over how I feel, over what I want. I find that those decisions are actually the hardest. And so those are the things that I struggle with every day. But if I have small victories in those things every day, then they make it a little bit easier to try and achieve the, the slightly bigger things. And I think I'll finish there and I hope I've come in on time and I hope that you found this useful. Anu, thank you so much for um, for giving us your time and for speaking so openly, vulnerably, and um, and for inspiring us as well. Thank you for uh, for you, your inspiring example and for your ministry and all that you bring to uh, to the UK and to the and to and and beyond as well. It's a real inspiration. I know there'll be people that are on on this and watching this now and later who you know maybe are on the edge of um you know just tr pushing into new things you talked about going from you know quite a set path and then and then really pivoting to something new and i i think in the last couple of years we will have seen a lot of that um and i just wonder whether you had any um you know any uh, practical advice or things that you would encourage for people to be thinking about if they're in that if they haven't quite made a shift yet from what they're doing now, but they sense God calling them into a new thing, it's not an easy route, but there are some learnings along the way. I just wondered what couple of things you might share for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, but when we finish, you can make, please make my details available. I've actually got a slide with it, so I can give that to you. Um, but so that people can contact me if they have that question, because <laughs> I can't answer it all in one minute. But I would definitely say, um, be very clear about what God is saying to you. And that doesn't have to mean a big deep dive jump. I mean, it took me um, from the time it was stirring in my heart that I couldn't really continue in this job for much longer to the time I actually left was probably a good couple of years. So I wouldn't say that you, you should feel, if anyone's in that position, don't feel that you need to jump into it immediately, feet first, unless God is asking you to do that, you know? Um, and and all, I, I feel like incremental change is very healthy. Um, lots of support uh, from your, from my network and friends and family were, was, and church was invaluable. But also I would absolutely say, just once you know, deep within your heart that it's God that's leading you, hold on to that word, because that will be the thing that, that carries you through. 
there's a question that's come in from Anthony. Um, uh, just a little question about um, how it might align with uh, 1 Corinthians, where Paul um, talks, uh, says to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I, by all means, I might have so saved some. Um, just a little question around any comments on on that passage particularly yeah i i i um, think about that quite a bit actually i think the point is um understanding the purpose of becoming all things to all men because you can become all things to all men and then you're doing the opposite of what jesus was praying for in john 17 you're becoming the world rather than being in the world to share light and to, to be that salt and light. And so as uh, uh, once we are very clear that I am becoming weak so that I might save weak and uh, um, the weak and so on and so forth, absolutely. And I think that's crucial. I actually think that's a, a massive part of what we what we are supposed to do. 